please let me welcome, please let's welcome Raina Canada. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's definitely an honor to be back here at LTU, even though it was LIT. Um, I was here back in, uh, graduated in November of 86, so they basically, my diploma says 87. Um, it's been a great experience. I, I got some feedback from some of the students that they want to hear more about, a little bit about my background and myself. It, it's difficult to, at times for me to talk about myself and what I've done. The best is to have an interaction in, interactive dialogue. So please feel free to ask questions. I'm going to ask questions of you. So you're going to have to answer. I'll have to answer your questions. So my background, yes, is in mechanical engineering. I started at Lawrence. I was a co-op student. Um, I co-opted uh, with General Motors at Hydromatic Division. I started off at the Chevrolet Division, but wanted to learn about manufacturing. So I took the design experience from Chevy and went to Hydromatic and learned how to actually manufacture it and design simultaneously. But the question came up again and again, is this really what the customer wants? So throughout my whole career, I kept asking that question, kept um, taking my career and what I wanted to do one step further to getting the voice of the customer back into the products that we were doing. So this is something, the keys to marketing your innovation was what was titled to me with not much <laughs> more than that. So I figured I would go through and give you um, some basic insight to where my mindset is and what I'm thinking and when I go through this process. So I had to do some deep soul searching here too. Let's see if this will work. There we go. So I wanted to find out what's the difference between an engineer and an innovator and innovations. So how do you go from engineering to the marketplace? So some questions you might have. Um, are there truly great um, inventors and engineers? Are inventors truly innovators? Or can they be? Can they cross over? Um, I, when I first started, and I'll get into this in a minute, I wanted to go work at Bell Labs when I graduated. I don't know if you ever heard of Bell Labs, but <laughs> it was like any inventor wanted to go there. It was just a huge think tank. Um, but that's what I wanted to do, but I ended up going on to the other end, into the marketing and innovation. And I'll get into some of this and why that happened and how I transitioned. So I want to know where you see yourselves. Um, how do you make the transition from, en from engineer to inventor? Okay, how many here are engineers? I show hands. How many are mechanical, electrical, and management? Any management people in here? Okay, a few diverse First people. My master's degree is in international business and marketing, so I made, I called it the dark side. So going from engineering to the dark side, because engineers probably function with one side of their brain and marketing functions with the other. So it's very difficult to cross over. So I'll give you some ideas. So to invent, to pr produce or contrive something previously unknown um, by use of ingenuity or imagination. It's also to fabricate too and make up, but we won't talk about that part of it. It's usually typically never been done before, and it's usually patentable. And some of the great inventors. Newton, Einstein, and one of my favorite, and I'll get more into, um, anybody know who Richard Feynman is? Feynman, anybody know? You do? Who is he? What? I just heard a little bit about him. Okay, we'll get into him. He's, he's my new hero, and you'll understand why <laughs> shortly. So what is innovation? It's the creation and evolution and exchange of applications of new ideas into marketable goods and services. When you think about it, how many patents are just written and just sitting there? Probably millions. I don't know the number, but I've written some patents and they're not applied. Other people have written patents. Great ideas, but they're not in the market. So we'll get into why, a little bit of why that is. But it, the way you do innovation is for the success of an of enterprise, the vitality of a nation's economy, or the advancement of society. So what do you need for an innovation? Let's see if this will work. There we go. What's desirable to the users? Got to know what the voice of the customer is. What do they really want? Because if they don't want what you have, you're not going to market it. Uh, what's possible with technology? And this is my favorite. I read, I think I get about 50 to 100 emails a day just on technology from all the various industries. What's happening in them? 
what's coming up, what are they working on. Nassau Tax Briefs was my favorite one when I was in college, and it's still available today, and it's free. So I recommend everybody get it. <laughs> this, how many get Nassau Tax Briefs? Nobody? One. Woo, my hero. That's awesome. It's a fantastic publication to find out what's going on in technology. And the, the, the funny thing is, ask those questions when you, when you read something. How can that apply? Is it applicable to something else? Am I working on something that's unique and interesting? When I was at Lawrence, incredibly enough, I gave this story earlier, I was working for General Motors and I was doing some machining. And the tools that we were using, the cutting tools, were wearing out fast. So I was looking at how can I use my uh, materials lab research in my materials class, looking at base center cubics and body center cubics, and how can I harden the surface in such a way that I could get better performance on the machine tools. And ion impregnation came up. So I was asking my professor about ion impregnation. What do you know about it? Can I use it for these <laughs> machine tools? And it was clueless at the time. But here now at Lawrence, you can ask these questions, and you can explore things differently. And that's one thing you really, really need to keep in mind. Ask the questions and keep asking them because there are answers out there. And if you don't find them, find them yourself. It was more fun. College to me was fascinating when I asked questions and went off on tangents and looked at things differently. So, oh, they're playing a band for me. <laughs> okay, what is viable in the marketplace? So, is it marketable? You can have the best widget in the world, but if, you can't, if it's not viable in the marketplace, forget it. And all this leads into is innovation. So what does it take? Inspiration, vision, uh, the future, and I'll get into all of these things. So can you name some inventors, or innovators, I'm sorry. You know who that guy is? Thomas Edison. One of my favorites is Thomas, oh, I, let me back it up a second. Thomas Edison was really cool to me. I was reading a book on him. And what he did was, you know, yeah, he had the incandescent light bulb. He just actually didn't really invent it. He made it a little bit better, but he made it marketable. And I'll get to it in a minute. In, eight, in 1888, <laughs> we really got music. In 1888, he actually designed, developed, built, and sold electric cars. Anybody know that? Hey, somebody knew that. So it's really cool. Steve Jobs, innovator, right? I have proof here, right here. Uh, anybody know who uh, Vinton Cerf is? Oh my God. You do it every day. Surf. The web. That's surf. That's where the term comes from. <laughs> oh my God. It's not really surfing, it's surfing. So, yeah, sorry. Um, Tom Burns Lee. Anybody know who he is? You type it every single day. WWW. Everybody knows who Scram Bell is. Anybody uh, know who Jeff Bezos is? Nope. He changed retail. Got it. Amazon. Okay. Henry Ford. Everybody knows. Manufa no, it's not automobile. Uh, it wasn't the automobile. Automobile wasn't a disruptive technology. It was the assembly line. You know who these guys are. They're one of my favorites. I'm also a pilot, so I love these guys. Anybody know who Dr. Um, Jar Jarvik is? Hart, exactly. And he was a doctor, but he's also an engineer, too. Medical doctor and an engineer. So great innovators. Let's see. Okay, I talked about Bell Labs, and it's funny because life comes full circle. I really wanted to work there. They are no longer um, in business, unfortunately. But in, in 1919, Kemet's the company I work for currently. It was owned by Union Carbide. Um, data, so I'm just giving you a timeline here. So in 1925, a getter was invented, and that's what Kemet did. They made getters. And gutters were used with vacuum tubes. 
But what happened was in 1947, it was replaced vacuum tubes with a transistor. That was um, invented in Bell Labs. So what happens when you take a vacuum tube in the gutter and you replace the vacuum tube with a transistor? Bye-bye gutter. <laughs> Went the way of the dodo bird. But luckily, Bell Labs invented the capacitor, and that's what we make as capacitors. So in 1950, the gutter was out of business and the tantalum capacitor was invented. And that's what we do today. Something else, some other ones that you didn't probably didn't know, cellular telephone technology in 1947 came out of Bell Labs. Solar cells were in 1954. Laser in 58. Digital transmission and switching. Communication satellite that went up into space, actually. Whoop, let me go back. Sorry. This was really cool to me, was the fact that um, in 1962, they built and launched the, the um, satellite system, but they also had their solar system on there. So that was back in 62, and we think of solar today. It's pretty interesting. Unix operating system in C language and digital signal processing all came out of Bell Labs. So is there anything new today? It's a good question. So I just took one industry because I'm near and dear to the automotive as well. I took electric and hybrid cars. And I have to look to my notes because I want to make sure I get these dates straight. So I apologize. OK. So let's see. The first electric taxi fleet was in New York in 1897. There it was. OK. And the company was called, oh, where's the name? Woods Motor Company. They were out of Chicago, Illinois. So electric cars aren't really new, are they? Woods Motor Company actually in 1966 did the first hybrid electric vehicle as well. So Prius, nah, old hat. I told you about the Addison in 1899. And Nissan actually had an electric vehicle in 1947. Amazing, isn't it? Now you got the Leaf. You have the Mitsubishi, and you had the EV1 back in, EV1 was in 1996. And you have the Prius that's outdated because in 1919 or, or in 1916 was the first hybrid. So go figure. Nothing new, right? I want to talk about disruptive technologies. Disruptive technologies are innovations um, that disrupts the existing marketplace. It actually moves it and takes it out from its roots. So for example, the, well, I'll give you some examples, of, but the gutter was a great example of what happened. It's gone, went way of the dodo, when transistor came, it disrupted the technology, and now you have capacitors. So can you name some disruptive technologies that came out there? And what markets got disrupted? Disrupted. Um, eight, 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 eight. Okay. Anybody else? Disrupted. <laughs> do you know what? Do you know what disrupted? disrupted my <laughs> yeah, disrupted your eye. <laughs> that too. Do you know what's funny though? Um, Michelin. I was talking to somebody from um, from Michelin, and they were saying they had the great invention of run flat tires. Do you remember run flat tires? Right. Right, and do you know why they died and they're no longer on cars? Do you know what disrupted them? Cellular phones. Cellular phones. Why? They can call for help. Oh, you get a tire changed in five minutes or less. Yeah, they didn't see it coming. Anybody else? Yeah. 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 Good ones. Here's some I just came up. Digital cameras. Kodak. You know, Kodak actually invented digital technology for cameras, and look at where they are now. Um, automobile disrupted and the rails transport. Rail transport thought they, they weren't in the business of moving people. They were in rails. They didn't think of themselves outside of what they truly were. Plastics disrupted some metal, wood, and glass. LEDs disrupted by the light bulbs. LCDs and CRTs. Anybody use a, any CRTs left anymore? I didn't think so. <laughs> I haven't seen a CRT in a long time. Maps, paper maps are gone. You have GPS now. Um, anybody own an encyclopedia when they were growing up? 
oh my god, people actually had encyclopedias. Wow, I'm not that old then. <laughs> yeah, Wikipedia now. <laughs> so thinking forward, can you identify any major disruptive technologies and what industries they would affect and how? I, uh, I came up with one that's really cool that's near and dear to my heart because I saw uh, Nova is another good source of information. But I'll give you a hint. See if you can get what the hint is. See if it will work. Can you guess what it is? No? What is, it's not, not a stopwatch. Think of what it's doing. The action. And think of what it can do to disrupt. Teleporting. And I'm not talking humans. I'm just talking moving an object from one place to another, teleporting it. What would that do and what would that disrupt? Shipping, trucking, manufacturing, retail, internet, mail carriers, UPS, FedEx, airlines, automobiles, trains, trash pickup. Don't need trash pickup, you teleport right to the dump. Um, groceries, liquor stores, anything else. People said, oh, I don't like ordering online. Well, you order online, you get teleported in front of you, you can try it out or try it on, you don't like it, teleport it back. Two seconds, right? Yeah, no worries. <laughs> but but, there, but they, I mean, that's way far out in the future. I, you can bring some other technologies that are near term and apply them, but you have to be thinking about that. What's the next thing? When I came to Kemet a year and just over a year and a half ago, I said, what's going to replace the capacitor? So right now we're working on embedded technology. Okay, so we're embedding. So we're not making capacitors anymore. We're making embedded technology. So now we're going to have to move not only embedded technology, but everything around it. Because if, we, if we're going to do this embedded technology, we're going to have to do more than capacitance within the embedded circuit board. So start thinking the next, what's going to displace me? What's going to displace us as we go forward? Um, this is near and dear to my heart, and this is where Feynman comes in. Feynman, sorry. Um, it's nanotechnology. Okay. If you think about nanotechnology, there's over 700 products today, if not more, that are touched by nanotechnology. There are, will be, in the next 10 to 15 years, 800,000 jobs created in nanotechnology. So you want to talk about what's next and what you want to be doing, what you want to be thinking, start thinking about nanotechnology. And I'll play, here's a, whoop. I think I have to hit it with the mouse. So this will give you a the little bit. The of nanotechnology really actually goes back to a talk given by Richard Feynman, which was entitled, there's plenty of room at the bottom in the late 50s, the Nobel laureate, Richard Feynman, that there was nothing in the laws of physics that he could see that precluded the idea of manipulating things on an atom by Thank basis. you. And that really is the, is, is the beginning of the revolution of making that instruction. When he said that in the 50s, nobody had ever seen an atom. We started developing electron microscopes, which allowed us to get really close looks at how physical things are built at the molecular scale. But still, all that didn't allow us to, to do was image these things. Scientists at IBM took 35 xenon atoms and arranged them in the letters IBF as a way of showing that, yeah, we can move little atoms around now in whatever way we want. Don Ida was the first person to actually implement or prove that principle by taking a scan and telling microscope, which a Billy Monroe got a Nobel Prize for their invention of that tool. What Billy Monroe had done was to discover scan and telling microscopy. He was making a fine sharp tip and moving it across the surface, all I can know, and looking for bumps in the surface. And he was doing it by looking at the current from the tip that's going into the surface. And he uh, realized that the sharpest tip he could make, viewed uh, at the molecular level, looked like this. Um, and so he was really using a very blunt instrument to try and probe the surface. But what he wrote in the margin was, well, actually, this tip ends in a bunch of molecules. And some days, there may be one atom that's more prominent at the end. And, of course, that's how SPM works. He then, having the concept, you must have a concept, first, 
He then looked at his results, and by God, the current was oscillating uh, here and there, occasionally, on a good day. Uh, it was oscillating at a separation which corresponded to atomic separations. He made a great discovery. He was looking more directly at individual atoms than anybody ever had before. And as the years of the press since that, we began to exercise greater and greater control over what could occur at that nanoscale. Nanotechnology as uh, a buzzword and as a field really didn't take off until the mid-1980s uh, with the publish, publication of a book by uh, uh, Eric Drexler. Engines of Creation. It was one of those simple books that caught the public imagination. Making some of the grand promises that nanotechnology might have. And this was a big, big positive hype that came out. And that really broke things over for nanotechnology. Every science fiction writer in the world took note of that book when it came out and said, what, what did we do with these wonderful ideas? However, other researchers then came out with more skeptical views of nanotechnology. And it's almost as if we could in an ongoing debate between those two camps. So what happened is we went from the notion that you should be able to do this to the ability to see what we were working with and finally to having a tool that was fun enough to let us push atoms around. And the next step is, of course, going to be to build little machines that we can push around for us and do it of their own volition uh, with the parameters that we establish. So nanoscience, the work of applying newly developed microsco microscopes to observing, measuring, and creating molecular and atom atomic level. So it's going all the way down to the billionth scale. And what does this touch? It touches every industry that, that I'm in. It touches every, every product just about on the face of the earth. So in the military, they're, they're using it um, to get rid of odor. So the socks and underwear can now be worn, unfortunately, for, for weeks at a time, believe it or not. Yeah, yeah, odor control. Um, in, in the um, next picture over to the, to the right, it shows this is what they wear when they go hunting. And what they wanted is uh, odor proof. So they can't smell the scent of the human. The animals can't. So it's odor proofed. Um, when it's, the mask that the gentleman's wearing um, when exposed to light kills viruses and bacteria. Um, it allows fabric, you see the tie there, um, it's stain resistant. If you buy a shirt now that's wrinkle proof or pants that are wrinkle proof, that's all nanotechnology that's being utilized. It's in our food as well. It's engineered in our food. Um, so, and then the last one, the one I like is the, the nanobot. Actually, they're developing in this now. It's smaller than a blood cell, and it's injected into your body. And what it does is it will, it's programmed to go to your cancer cell and deposit medicine to kill the cancer cells individually so it doesn't affect the rest of your body. So it's touching everything. Yeah. How far off is that from public? I'm sorry? How far off is that from public to be killed? To, to be uh, public to kill. To kill? They're, they're working on it now. It's now. This is now. Yeah. The clothing is now. The um, solar panel, that's now. Um, pretty soon you put a film. Actually, the film for, for nanotubes, uh, fluorines, you can put them onto glass right now. And then it will take, um, you can tune the fluorines, the, the nanotubes, to absorb different types of light. Um, different frequencies of light. And then you can harness that energy and you can use it. And then if you're not using it, you can bounce it to another building and it can be used over there. So energy could be free. Electricity could be free, free flowing. This is, it's a type of solar. It's, it's just, it's just, yeah. Technology is moving so quickly that, um, and the cost of solar right now is almost on par for um, gas, right? It's coming close to it. So for generating, like, for producing electricity. Um, I think this is going to be next, and then and it'll be, as soon as it's, how do you say, right now it's expensive to manufacture. So you're, the, it's now, but the price point's just too high. Again, you have to see the market and what the value is to the marketplace. But give it another 10, 10 years or so, 15 years, and it'll be there. Yeah. They have uh, uh, one of the students, not here, but the MakerBot, and how it, it was now making the little solar panels. 
little thousand dollar machine. Yeah. So. Yeah. It will get there. Um, I'm, I'm working on a technology right now, and I'll show a picture of it. Um, it's, um, it's an energy storage device or supercapacitor. And right now, there's 3,000 farads that, that fit into a can about like that big. I wish I brought one. I apologize. I wasn't thinking. It came from a customer. I had them, but my counterparts took them. Uh, but anyways, um, right now, uh, with the energy density and power density that are in there, with the new nanotube technology that we're developing and working with, it could be three times that and less cost to manufacture. So we're talking on a huge leap in technology that's coming. So, and here's pictures of them. <laughs> so on the right are supercapacitors, and that's what I'm, I'm launching right now. This was about two, two and a half years in the works. And what it does is it's, it's high power and lower energy. But when you're thinking of an electric vehicle or electrification of something, you, when you need high power, the, the battery cannot produce the amount of power that's necessary. So for regenerative braking and, and for charging back up, the battery can't charge that fast and it can't discharge very fast. But a capacitor can, and supercapacitors very much so, and in a small canister. So what you'll do is when you step on the brake, it will regen into the supercapacitor, and then when you press on the accelerator, it will give you the power to go f very fast at the beginning, and then the batteries will take over for the steady state. And also the supercapacitors run cycle after cycle after cycle, where batteries over time, because batteries are a chemical reaction and supercapacitors are not. It's a, basically a mechanical internal a transfer of electrons just over back and forth. Um, there's no chemical reaction that takes place, so no bro breakdown of materials. On the left is an energy storage device with BMS. This is one, uh, this is my Gen 2, or Gen, no, this is Gen 1, I'm sorry. This is Gen 1 device. Um, it is for a um, automated guided vehicle. So, so it will um, run for about an hour, and then it will charge in five minutes. So, and it will run continuously. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so some cool concepts that are actually coming through to fruition. And again, it's talking about talking to the customer and realizing what the market needs are. Um, and it's very key and critical, especially in energy storage, because there's a lot of talk about it for um, solar and wind and things like that, but it's very expensive. So how do you get that to a reality? And where is the best place for energy storage? Um, uh, CES, which is the community energy storage, everybody talks about that, but that's about five years off from now to have a really good value impact and value equation. So you start where you start looking at the markets, where they are, where is the technology most applicable, and then how do you produce to get there within the and deliver value? Okay. So. Nano is very small scale. See this. this is some more future. This will be really fun. I think this is cool. Wall display is one of thin and large displays to deliver information for convenient life. See-through electronics consists of transparent LED and nano network. This gets into the embedded that I was talking about. And large display. to electrical energy by using the PSO electric nano wire. Nano PSO electric energy generator will be used for self power of a wireless sensor or mobile device. Real time body scanning for medical checkup is possible using an array of nano antenna deployed on the surface of the mirror which sends and receives the terahertz electromagnetic wave generated from terahertz oscillator.
physical condition can be checked without invasive treatment by using radio frequency waves. The electromagnetic wave generator and detector are integrated in the patch sensor. As you've seen here, nanotechnology will empower our society with innovative creation. That just gives you a flavor of asking the questions, what if and where can we go with this? And there's a lot more that can be done with the nanotechnology. So marketing your innovation. You can start off with a technology. So you have an idea of a technology. You can have a concept. You can start looking at the marketplace, and then you have inspiration. And that's pretty much... Um, how I was doing it when you look at energy storage. So we had technologies that are out there, a multitude of them. I had a concept and an idea. I started looking at the market and saying, okay, where is this applicable for? And then I was inspired because it is the right thing to do, especially with um, being a green person that I am. And if you have questions about that, I can go into that too. There's a whole other story with that one. Also having a vision of where it can go, how it can be done, um, what's the right market, what's the right product, and then having it, knowing what the future or what the possibility, realm of possibilities are for the future. The other way you can go is you can have inspiration. You have some sort of, you're inspired by something, and you have an idea of what the future is. And one way we used to do this in one of the companies I worked for was starting to tell a story. And what you do is you have, I'm driving down, driving down the home from work, Okay, and I get a phone call. I mean, this was way back before uh, cell phones were just starting to become popular in cars, so bear with me on the story. And um, so anyways, I get a phone call from my wife and, uh, or my husband, and he said, oh, the kids are hungry, can you stop off and get a pizza? And then you pass the story on along. And what happened was it, it got into um, asking the car where the pizza stations are or, or the car telling you where the, your favorite pizza shop is and then it orders the pizza for you. It gives you the car, the GPS knows where you are and where the pizza station is, so they knew your ETA. So they had the pizza hot and fresh ready for you, and you didn't pay because it was an electronic transfer of funds. And you can go on from there, but you can actually take a storyline and then progress with the storyline and throw it around the campus and see where it goes. See where the imagination will take that story by just starting off with one thing. It's a fun thing to do. And when you get it back, you say, OK, what technology is applicable to that? And what's coming down the pipe to actually make that happen? Because necessity is the mother of invention. So all of a sudden, pretty soon, it'll become a necessity. Um, so that's where the vision comes from. And then you have a market because you know it's going to be marketable because you have the people are creating it themselves. And then you get the concept and then you, and the technology to go forward from there. So that's my story. And, and there's a lot more stories I can tell. <laughs> I have too many. So I don't know. I wouldn't know where to begin and where to stop. But hopefully that gives you a flavor for the way I look at things moving forward, um, the research that I do, the openness to information and technology and hearing of new things and new ideas, and then say, hey, how can we make this happen for my company? Or if you're an entrepreneur, how can I make that happen for me? What inspires me? What drives me and motivates me that I can make a change or make a difference? So, so well, thank, thank you. you very much. One of the things that Rain and I talked about was really opening up for a dialogue. So uh, let me ask you, how many uh, of you have ideas or uh, ideas for a business or, or a product or a technology or actually have an existing business? Any, any hands? So, great. Great. So um, again, uh, we, we had a real good dialogue with uh, some students and, and faculty earlier. And this is really your time to uh, ask anything that you want about you know, technology development, the marketing aspects of things, uh, other career things. I mean, this is your time uh, to, to maybe get a little bit more insight into uh, you know, uh, what, what Raina's experience or, or maybe have an idea that you want to bounce off. So please feel free. Sure. In regards to marketing technology, especially how do you market or develop your marketing plan to identify your competition? 
How difficult is that, and when, how to be able to set the price? Okay. Um, good questions. Um, for the competition, um, typically we do a full-blown analysis on the competition and where they are, what they're doing, as much as we can get as far as information goes. You can learn a lot from the web and a lot from different things and blogging now and all of that. So, so we try to learn where they are and just know where their position is. I don't really want to follow the competition. I want to lead and lead, be in tune to my own drummer. So I, I try to go. I mean, you have to know where they are and what they're doing. But you don't necessarily, do I want to react or not? It's um, the, what is it, the prisoner's, what do they call that? In the prisoner's dilemma. <laughs> Have you guys done prisoner's dilemma? No. That's probably a good thing to, to do is a pr prisoner's dilemma. So what if they do this and what if we do that and what happens from there? Um, as far as pricing goes, um, I like to look at value pricing. So for the energy storage system, we typically, capacitors run pennies up to maybe $100. That energy storage system that showed up there is $20,000. Okay. Yeah, for one. For one. So it's a lot of money. But the customer is willing to pay for it because I can demonstrate a value to them. Because they're do, utilizing lead-acid batteries currently. They have two that they have to buy. It's an hour changeover to change over. So there's cost of that. There's cost of ownership. They have to service the lead-acid battery. There's a cost to do that. So I outline all of that and what are they willing to pay currently today and how can I, how can I replace it with, with this new technology that's clean and green and, and what does that mean to them and how much would they value it. So I do it on a value basis. And I price that way. Value uh, formulas to work with that. When you have your manufacturing cost, your design cost. Right. The, the bottom line is, if you can't, if you look at what the value is to the customer, and you subtract off your manufacturing co your cost to manufacture it, and then you have a uh, your profit at the bottom. If that, if you, if it's negative, then you won't be, able, you can't be in that business. Get out. <laughs> So I look at it from the backwards equation. So what is, the, what is the value to the customer? How can I make it? And I look at you know the costs. And maybe at first I'm only going to make a certain margin. Maybe I'll only make 25 or 30% margin. I want to get 50 or 60% margin. I shouldn't be telling you these things. but <laughs> um, So I go back and I, I price it up based on value. And I get my more, more margin by optimizing my processes and my technology. But if it's negative, I won't do it. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Or wait till they value it more. Or wait till the cost of the materials come down. Then that's what's happening in CES. So consume, the, the community energy storage, um, I, can sell, I can build those systems right now, no, no problem. But they won't pay what, what I can want for them. They don't value it. But give me, a few, give me five years, and the value proposition will be very different. So I have a question. Um, sure. What two things uh, from your education here uh, has helped you the most in your career? The piece of paper that I got at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it was a joke. <laughs> you can't do anything without it, so, so stay in school. Um, I, I think I was talking earlier, and I said the lessons that you learn in school, and, and my parents told me this too, and I didn't believe them at the time, but the things that you learn to do throughout your, throughout your experience here at Lawrence will be the same, will be used over and over again throughout your career. There's no doubt about it. So what you're learning here, and I'm not talking about the academics, I'm talking about everything in general. You know, your balancing of studying, your balancing of you know, your activities outside of class, everything will come into play throughout your life. So that was probably number one. Um, number two is I've always been a, inquisitive, and uh, I always liked asking a lot of questions. I, I think that's partially some of the professors here. I would say nine, when I was here, probably 90% of them were like that, were open to it, where 10% might not. In those classes, I probably just switched out of, and for the most part. <laughs> I tried to go find a professor that liked asking student, students asking a lot of questions. Uh, but I hear you have a great program where, where you actually look at 
students to be more actively involved and ask those questions and be part participant, I say do it. Anything you can jump on, do it. Anything you have passion for, go forward with it. So. Please, any other questions? So why do you think, you know, looking at it from a customer's point of view, that um, hybrids didn't happen? Why, why is it that they just didn't take off back in the much, much earlier days as opposed to... And the electric vehicle didn't take off for a very, you had to stop and charge again. You know, even the first gas vehicle actually didn't take off very well because I think, I can't remember who it was who drove it with the gas tanks that they would carry with them to fill it up the gas, yeah. I think it was the, t the time, time to charge up versus gas. The infrastructure, the infrastructure. But back in, I saw a picture of Detroit that had all these charge stations on, and in New York they had the taxis. So I, I don't... Yeah, it does take longer to charge. I mean, they're getting quick charge. Batteries don't like fast charge. They don't like temp. They don't like heat. So as soon as we get beyond, when the te technology becomes even a little bit more riper, it will, it will happen. I mean, for the average commuter, I worked on the Leaf for four years. By the way, I was in Japan for for two of those years working on on the implementation of the electric vehicle for Nissan. So. Uh, the biggest challenge for for Nissan at this er, this time was they shouldn't have been selling a car; they should be selling away a life or a concept. Because for the average driver, you know, 75 to 100 miles range a day is fine; it, it's not a big deal. And their charge state the charger that they put on was a 3.3 kilowatt hour, and they do have a 6.6 .6 kilowatt hour. Why they're not putting it on, I don't know, but they, we were charging four hours, so. Quick chargers are extremely costly and not very, very, not very beneficial. They only charge to 80% because you get into the, the temperature range that batteries don't like. So there are some things that need to be done. It's just going to be time. And maybe it wasn't quite right to come out with the LEAF at this time, but, I mean, it is, um, there was a mandate that caused it. That's why. The real answer is the customer value isn't there. Yeah. Right? That's what I wonder. From a customer's point of view. It's just not there. Well, the, the hybrid, yeah, definitely. It's $6,000 for, yeah. for a hybrid vehicle. And over the life, your payback is seven, eight years. Well, and, 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 and an electric vehicle in this, in this area mm -hmm. makes no sense whatsoever. Right. right? And maybe in Florida or Texas or Arizona, it makes a little more sense. Yeah. But you know, batteries don't like coal. No. And so up, up here, it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. So what? Um, but capacitors don't like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, on a global scale, uh, from uh, knowing your customer in the states versus knowing your customer in Germany or China or India, what variations would you say? that has to take place to understand the different cultures and what people want? Ooh. Um, go ahead. Overall, I think the basics are the same. Smaller, cheaper, faster <laughs> has been the theme, especially in um, computing and technology. So getting it smaller, getting it less expensive, and getting it to market fast, getting it to run faster has been the theme. How you do business, though, vastly different. Um, if you go to Japan, for example, and you want to do business and you've never done business there before, count on a minimum of three years. Minimum of three years before. And you've got to keep working the relationship and working the relationship. It's all about the relationship. Um, if you go to... Um, I'm trying to think. If you go to the... If you go to Europe, for the most part, um, it varies in Germany versus the other. I mean, you, I, my recommendation is when I went to the various countries and did work with the, the various governments, um, I learned their culture and them all about the country. I knew more about what they were doing with their electricity than they knew. 
and how it was generated and where it was generated and how much they used and how much they charged in their their um, subsidization schemes and things like that. Because I was going to introduce an electric vehicle and I needed electricity to run it. So what is their hot ticket items? So that's pretty much the best advice I can give because doing business, it's, it's so vastly different in each country. So one other thing that you mentioned earlier, um, you mentioned uh, so some career advice, uh, uh, really, and, and about um, when you're interviewing people and people say, you know, what do you want to do? And they, they reply, well, I want your job. Oh. Um, <laughs> and I say they can have it. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell, tell about what, what people actually do. I mean, what, what's, what, what does it I, take? I think, I think you really have to know what you want and know yourself and know what motivates you and drives you. Um, so when I interview somebody, like, like you said, and they, I say, what do you want to do in five years? And they say, I want your job. I say, that's great. So what you do is you, know, you give people the opportunities um, when they work for me, it's, it's fine. I give them all the opportunities, and I would say about 99% of them say, I don't want your job at the end of the day. Um, <laughs> and that's the unfortunate part. I can never find my replacement, so it's always difficult. But, it, you know, set your goals. You know, in, in, a few, in this amount of time, I want to do this, and then make the strides to get there. You know, have a, a, have a little path to where you want to go. I mean, for me, energy storage, going from the automobile and going into you know, electrification of the automobile and then energy storage and where the technology is going and nanotechnology in the future, you know, I would, I would love to be able to, I'm going to be doing energy harvesting. I'm an energy harvesting committee. So I like doing a lot. So I keep taking and moving with my passions. So I would say to harness your passions, harness what you like. Harness all those things, and then it will come to you. Um, <laughs> the, the funny part was um, I said when I was little, there was a couple of different stories when I was younger. I wanted to travel the world and make decisions for companies because most companies, most executives can't make decisions. So and I want to get paid to do it. So for the longest time, I was doing actually that. <laughs> so, that was, so be careful what you wish for as well. You might end up with it as well. So. Uh, mentors and bosses that you've had or leaders that you've had in your, in your life, um, can you talk about the value of that and the value of staying in contact? Yeah, definitely. My first boss said, uh, from Ford Motor Company, I'm still in touch with. I lost touch with a couple from General Motors. Um, I'm still in touch with probably about 70% of my old bosses. So about that, and colleagues as well. And they're all over the world in all different industries. Um, anybody on LinkedIn? Ah, definitely. Stay on LinkedIn. Talk to people on LinkedIn. Find out if you're interested in, in a company, if you're interested in uh, technology through that. It's the best way because it's a very professional way to look at it. It's not, you know, I, I have Facebook, but I hate it. I don't want anybody to know anything about, about me in that regard. But from a LinkedIn perspective, it's very business. So if you contacted me on LinkedIn, I would, re, I would respond to you. You're a Lawrence Tech grad. I'm a Lawrence Tech grad. I'll respond. I'll talk to you. So you can look up and see all the Lawrence Tech grads and where they're located and say, hey, I'm really interested in this technology or this industry. And it opens up a multitude of doors. And then find your mentors. You know, throughout your career, is it a professor or is it, you know, um, is it somebody you know, a friend of your family's, or whatever? Keep that going. Um, in fact, I used one of my mentors. Unfortunately, he passed away. He was a senator. So I used him, um, not used him, but kept in touch with him. And he opened up a lot of doors for me. And that's the way it is. And somebody's going to come to you and want, to be, want you to be their mentor. Do the same. Because we're all connected. Human beings are all connected. So it's part of life. What are the biggest things that you think you bring from the engineering side into your business? Practicality. <laughs> I, I think engineers are very, um, we were talking about that, black and white. Uh, I think pragmatic, um, analy your analytical skills are very good. The, the sad part is that sometimes it, 
like we were talking about, sometimes the things that make us great also ha hinder us. So be careful about that. Because moving over to the other side wasn't that easy. I mean, it was a transition for me. Because I was in a lab I developed and wrote, had patents and all sorts of things going on. And I, I liked it. But I, I wanted to move to the other side. Um, probably taking some business classes, too, d doesn't help or hurt. And a lot of reading. <laughs> so... Earlier uh, in the discussion, you had some interesting insights on the, uh, the differences between uh, B2B and B2C yes. uh, marketing and the importance of, if you're in B2B, the importance of knowing your customer's customer. Mm -hmm. Could you, you expand on that? Sure. Um, this was never, well, I don't know of anybody else who has done this before. I was working for a company that had some really fantastic, innovative technology. And they wanted to market it back to the auto companies. It was to go, the technology went into vehicles. Um, two things you want to know when you do that is what's the customer, what's the value to the customer? How much is the end user willing to pay, you know, the consumer? And um, is it something that they want or value to begin with in the vehicle? So what I did was um, I came up with this great concept of doing marketing research. Well, that's not a great concept. But what I did was I wanted to do the research like an OEM would do, like Ford or GM and Chrysler would do on these various technologies. But before I went out and did that, I went to each of the OEMs uh, around the world, so all of them, and I got their input on this is the research I want to do. These are our products. These are the research. And I even put in other people's technologies as well and products so I could weigh out and see what the true value of our products were against somebody else's. And I found out if I did that, you know, is there anything else I need to add to this research? And also, by the way, if I do this research, will you buy into it? which is the most critical portion of it. So, now, so when I was done with the research, everybody bought in, they put in their input, went out and did the research, came back with the results. I had a price point for the products that they would sell, and so I knew from that price point how much I could sell them to. So I had my great margins, because I already knew already what they would sell it to the market for. I knew what their markup is, because I worked there before, and I knew my markup that I, that I would want it, that I could achieve. So that was huge and never been done before, as far as I know, and I don't know if anybody's ever done it since. So, so, so the point, one of the points here is, is engaging customers um, to help you create your solution. Um, and again, it's, it, it's something that a lot of people are definitely afraid of, of going out and, re and asking questions and trying to really um, uh, you know, people sometimes feel foolish about going out and talking to someone about their idea. That okay? uh, they're going to shoot me down. But it's better to be have that have feedback and input then rather than going off into a corner and making something and then taking to them and they say this is the, this misses the mark. So as early as possible uh, to really be able to get out there and get that that input and and they become a partner in in the process. And then a customer. The other thing too, from a I'm a B2, B2, uh, B2B marketing, so and the strategy side. The other thing is, um, I guess you'd say, being a salute, trying to move the needle instead of providing just a, a widget or a product because you can create a great widget and everything else. Be a solution provider. So I'm not providing you anymore with a widget. Anybody can provide that widget or make that widget. I'm providing you a solution to your problem. Okay, and if you can provide a solution to somebody's problem, they're much more happier than you just give, selling them a widget. Any other questions? Uh, come on down real quick. So uh, we, we, we saved uh, the, the, the student uh, <laughs> the CEO club here uh, as, as one of the uh, Organization by campus, you had a chance oh, to, to meet. Oh, uh, thank earlier. you. So, um, Fantastic. On, on behalf of the uh, Collegiate Entrepreneur Organization, uh, they wanted to thank you for being here, and uh, uh, I hope you can come back sometime soon. So. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, much. Thank you Anna. Uh, Again, our, ne our next. Uh, our next uh, uh, event is uh, about a month from now, but it'll be in M 
218. And again, thank you very much. And if you're uh, still hungry or thirsty, please feel free to grab a, a piece of pizza uh, and a pot. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>